All right, so today we're going to be getting into news site three. But before we do that, there are a few things I would like to kind of go over with you all. And I would especially like to return to some of the concepts of uh, asynchronous JavaScript, because that's going to be a big focus of where we're, what we're doing from here on out. Uh, but before we even get to that, I want to make, you know, go over a few terms and just make sure we're all on the same page. So could somebody please define for me what a React component is? It's a small script that returns uh, an area of markup. Mm -hmm. Good. And what's the advantage of using components in this way? They're really easily reusable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if we make a component, we can assemble it like building blocks all together, and it makes it very, very easy to reuse code over and over again. All right, uh, does someone want to take a stab at defining what state is? So the state of your component, um, basically you can put in whatever uh, data you want, and it's attached to that component, and React will intelligently update the state of that component based on changes of that state. Mm -hmm. And what uh, data structure is kind of state comparable to? Like it follows the same rules as what? A JSON object or maybe even a Python dictionary. Mm -hmm. Exactly, very good. And finally, what is, what is props? It's the, uh, it's essentially arguments that you can pass to components. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good. You can pass it from a parent component to a child component. And whenever you instantiate a new component on the page, it might take props, it might not. And so props and state follow similar rules in terms of how they're organized. They're both very similar to JavaScript objects, but they aren't the same thing and they are, very, in fact, very different. Does anyone have any questions about, you know, those React concepts before we get into new stuff? or new old stuff, I should say. OK. So before we get into news site three, I want to talk a little bit about asynchronous JavaScript, because today's challenge uh, is going to be relatively light on the React stuff because we're going to be mostly talking about fetching data from another source. Up until now, News Site has used a static, a static document to keep track of our information using a data slash news.json. And we've been passing it to the article list component. And that's OK for now. But ideally, we want something, we want dynamic data, data that can change depending on what's going on in the back end of your project. So, you know, when you're working on a full stack production, uh, you know, there'll often be a front end developer and a back end developer, and you would, those two roles would speak with one another to figure, make sure they're on the same page of what type of data structure is going to be returned and how to best move forward. So, back end developers provide the data, the front end developer consumes the data and uses it. So, we're gonna have to, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about promises in greater detail than we've done before. So first off, I'd like to talk about Ajax. I think we may have used that word once or twice. Does anyone know what Ajax is short for? Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. That's right. So asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And Ajax is essentially the predecessor to fetch in some ways. And so Ajax would used to look like this. So you'd say $.ajax, go to some URL. And you may see this from time to time. It's still used by some companies. And then we'd say on a success, we'd run a function with the data that we fetched. And we could, you know, console.log, well, that data. And then we could also say, if there's an error, here's what we do instead. So 
this is the older way of making asynchronous JavaScript requests. And, you know, it's not a terrible way of doing things, all things considered. Uh, but AJAX was originally created to kind of grab data from widgets and then bring it back to your page. And the internet grew bigger and more complicated and AJAX became more unmanageable. So kind of a changing this up a bit, let's say you had a Facebook and you wanted to log in. So you'd make a request to facebook.com slash login. That's all well and good, but after you logged in, then you would also need to say, okay, once I've logged in, I would also need to get all of the posts that exist. So inside of this, I would have another AJAX call to Facebook. posts, and then we'd have maybe a second AJAX call inside of that, and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to do this entire thing because that takes a lot, but I'm just going to show you what that eventually gets you. You get stuff that looks like this. Uh, you may have heard of seen this before. It is sometimes called the JavaScript Christmas tree of doom, or uh, better known as callback hell because it's just, you know, all put inside of each other like this, like this, like this, like this. It's a mess. And nobody likes doing that. So that's why fetch was created, because fetch allows you to make these uh, asynchronous calls without de descending into hell. Uh, any questions about that so far? Uh, just for clarification, this so you're saying that um, fetch it replaces AJAX? Yes. Okay. It uh, does the same thing that AJAX does, but simplifies it. And what allows it to do this better are JavaScript promises. AJAX doesn't use promises. All right, so I'm going to kind of make an example here of, let's say we wanted to build a house, you know, theoretic, you know, building a house with JavaScript. So using fetch, essentially what I'd want to do is do one step at a time. Like, you know, we'd say fetch something called build house. This isn't a real example or anything. And then we'd say dot then. And after that, we'd want to return fetch, you know, for paint house dot then, we don't need to say return, we can just say fetch. Then we'd want to say dot then do another fetch where we get, you know, AC and electricity. So this is kind of the model we're going to be doing. And let, let's just do that are using promises. Uh, who remembers what a promise actually is? And what it lets us do? Uh, is, is it like a queue or something like that? So basically like whenever it uh, finished asynchronously processing whatever you asked it for the promise gets to jump in front of the queue and then execute that code. I think that's a good metaphor. It's not exactly a queue, but that's a good way of thinking about it in terms of the call stack. But what a promise is, is it's something that an asynchronous function returns immediately that won't actually be resolved until like, you know, it can, so it can essentially finish running so other things can run. And once that promise is resolved, then its effects will actually take place. And we can actually create our own promises if we want by just saying new promise, set it up as a function like so. And we can do stuff inside of this. So we can create our own promises. So I'm going to you know, kind of do that house building thing using promises and timeout to kind of give you a kind of an example of how promises work. 
So I'm going to write a function called build foundation. And it's going to return a new promise object. And as an argument, we're going to give this promise a callback function. So I'm going to call, say, function here. And the function is going to have one called resolve and one called reject. And then I'm going to set a timeout. So this is something that will run after a certain amount of time. And I'm going to give this one another function. You don't need to worry about like doing this. This is just kind of an example here. And I'm going to tell it to resolve. And then here I'm going to say, put the number 1,000. So what all this does is I've essentially created a promise that returns, that resolves after 1,000 milliseconds. That's all it does. It just resolves itself. So now if I run this, I would write call the build foundation function. Then I could use dot then. I'll put this on a separate line just because I like it better that way. I'm going to give this a pet arrow function that says console.log foundation built. So if I run this, So it waited 1,000 milliseconds and then, and then console.log. All right. And then I could make another function if I wanted to that essentially does the same thing. I'll just copy this over. And I'll call this one, you know, build frame and have this one go after 2,000 milliseconds. And I'll set up another dot then. I'll change this dot then so that after, it resol after the first one resolves, I'm going to run build frame. And when that's done resolving, I'm going to console.log. Actually, I'm going to add a console.log here. Foundation built, console.log, frame built. So just do it that way. So one pass, the second passes, foundation built, two second passes, frame is built. So again, this is just kind of a little slightly deeper dive into promises, kind of showing you know, essentially the resolve part is what allows this promise to function and allows us to have this uh, asynchronous thing actually work out. Any questions about uh, fetch or promises? Because I know these aren't really. All right. No, what's the reject for? Uh, so reject runs if the pr this is essentially if something goes wrong. So resolve is OK, everything worked the way it's supposed to be. We would call reject if there was some bad input, maybe, for example. And that still resolves the promise in terms of it allows it to say that it's finished doing its work. But it's just saying it finished doing its work and it did it, you know, it, it did it wrong somehow. OK. And these times are independent for each function, or are they set on the start time of the whole program. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Are these times that you see you put like a thousand there for one second and then two seconds, is that based on the start of the entire like ajax.js file or is it based on each start of each function? Uh, start of each function, I believe. And we can, you know, maybe like count that out a bit. So one, one, two. 
yeah, so it gets to here and that timeout gets called, set timeout, saying, okay, resolve this promise after 1000 milliseconds. And then it gets to here after that, after this promise resolves, then it start, then it runs build frame and that new timeout gets called. And I could, let's see what happens, for example, if I do the console.log, kind of do that after the dot thens. So that gets called immediately before the, the, before these promises get resolved. So this function gets run first, but it doesn't actually do anything. And this allows line 22 to run until that happens. All right, there are no further questions. Let's uh, get into news site three. So we take a look at news site three here. Actually, before we do any of that, I'm sorry, I forgot to go over kind of the larger goals for this week. So I'll do that right now before we get into the other stuff. So kind of the topics for this week fetch and JavaScript promises, which I just talked about, and we'll get into more into that and how it relates to React in just a few minutes. We're going to be talking more about React hooks and component lifecycle. We're going to be discussing service-oriented architecture, also known as SOA, and how to use Django as an API. And finally, we're going to be talking about using a web service called Heroku to deploy our apps. So at the end of this week, we should be able to not only create a full stack application, but deploy it to the web so that it'll be there until you take it off. So we kind of already talked about promises. Component lifecycle, the whole thing is that it allows us to react, hook into a React class component at any particular stage for various effects. So when a component loads, when a component is unloaded, all of these things, these lifecycle methods are kind of the bedrock of what makes React so fast and powerful. The React hooks are essentially you know, the equivalent to lifecycle methods, but for functional components. So as you move away from class components to functional components, React hooks become more important. Uh, well, talking about Django as a backend, React real-world applications are often too large to be built entirely in Django. You can, but it you know, gets clunky after a while. So it's much faster and more efficient to use Django as your back end just to interact with your database and using React.js for all the front end logic. So that allows you to make a more responsive app that is quicker and essentially it has, it's easier to work with because you don't have one large apparatus, you have two smaller ones. So after this, after this week, you should be able to understand the concept of promises clearly express the history of the web and why we use but no longer use Ajax. Uh, use fetch to get asynchronous data from external sources and bring it into a React app. We should be able to use lifecycle methods like component did mount to connect our API from a React class component. And we should also be able to use the React hook to use effect to connect it the same way. We'll be able to create a Django API that returns JSON to be used in React.js and we'll deploy apps to Heroku. Any questions about the topic for this week. Okay, in that case, let's get into new site three. So kind of like how we use news site one, we copied stuff over from news site two. From news, from news site two, we copied things over from news site one. We're gonna be copying over things from news site two into news site three. So let me load this up. I've already NPM installed for news site three and everything like that. So hopefully that we won't have any time long, long to wait for that. Make sure everything's working here. News site two. 
All right, so let's see what we're going to have to copy over. So we're going to have to copy over app.js, article.js, article list, article teaser, app nav, homepage, JS, all of that stuff. So we're going to new site three, our SRC file. We have the test files, but we don't actually have the have the actual components, and we've just got this. Okay, so just doing some quick copy pasting. Where's app.js? Where's app.js actually? Where'd it go? No, I just got just got to copy it over, copy it over completely from new site too. Fine. Yeah, it doesn't exist. I'm just gonna. Paste that in, app.js. Going to get our components here, app nav. Paste that in, article.js. Article list. And article teaser. And it looks like we already have these components here. We just need to copy, uh, you know, change the code there. So let me get the article page.js from here. And same thing for home page. All right. Anything else I'm missing here? All right. What's it doing there? Now that that's all done, I'm going to close out all these. I don't need all of these open at the moment. I'm going to go into news site three. And I'm going to run npm run start to make sure it all works. It's taking a sweet time with it. Uh oh, we have a problem. Can't resolve React strap, it says right there. John is uh, going to react strap. Yeah. All right, let's stop this. Uh, I know it's normally probably not a good practice, but uh, if we just copied all the NPM uh, node modules from new site two to new site three since everything's been within two days of each other i don't imagine too many packages have been updated enough to make a difference uh would well, that would have been easier so we wouldn't actually didn't have to do the install react trap i'm not sure uh i would have to actually check because we've added a couple of new like uh, some other new things into new site three because we're going to be working with API stuff. So I'm not sure how much the difference is. I'd have to take a look. All right, so I'm going to run the server again. What was the command they said here? npm run start.
And there is a good reason why we're using npm run start instead of npm start. Uh, you can, oh. OK. Cool. So we click here, we go here. Excellent. All right, so the reason that we've uh, used this command npm run start instead of npm start is because we're going to be incorporating an API into this. And when we run npm run start, we have some code here in the API fold. Uh, well, I don't know if it's here, but it runs a REST server on localhost 3001. So we go to localhost 3001 slash API slash articles. We see here now we have a RESTful API running here. Pretty cool, right? So this allows us to essentially create a test server that we can use and to dynamically update our page. So we'll be able to fetch data from this, and we should also be able to uh, post data to this as well. I don't think we're going to be getting into posting in this challenge, but we will be fetching data from this uh, server that we've created that has been created for us. And so it says right here, the endpoint returns a list of articles. And art articles can be filtered by any property through a request parameter called filter. The value of the filter request parameter should be set to a JSON string that resembles the following, where filtered key is the key you want to filter an object by, and filtered value is the corresponding value. So we did where byline equals by David Zucchino. So we would translate that to a URL like this way http localhost 2001 slash api slash articles then we have a question mark there to show that this is a query and then we set filter equal to where byline by david zucchino so if i copy this url put it here it filters it to where byline is by david zucchino and if i want to do you know i could also do things like by section and I want section to be world. Here's the same thing. I've got all of my world articles here. And we should also be able to look up individual articles by their ID number. So if I do API slash articles slash one, it gives me the ID with one. This one gives me the ID of two. All right, any questions about the article API before we move on to actually coding things? Uh, was that also, um, I know we in the code we put in the, you know, the minus one and the plus one to get it correct. So when we do a search in here, because of the server side, it can include zero for the, uh, what so, you just typed in. Mm -hmm. So if we try going to slash API article slash article slash zero, it doesn't have an ID of zero here. So we are going to have to change a few things here because we're not getting data just from a JSON file now. Now we're getting it from this place. So, so we don't need to do that. We shouldn't need to do the plus one slash minus one for this one. And we may have to update some of our code to reflect that. And we'll find out as we go through it. All right, any other questions about uh, the API? Hey, what extension are you using to get the nice formatted JSON output in the browser there? Uh, so the browser, uh, the one I'm using here is a JSON viewer. Highly recommend it. It's very, very useful. And it gives me the option to change it back to raw JSON. So without JSON viewer, it looks like this. With JSON viewer, it looks like that. Great. So let's take a look at what we're doing next. So next, we're going to be taking a look at src slash api slash article api.js, which is right here. And so we have a few methods stubbed out here. 
called Fetch Article by ID, Fetch Articles by Section, and just Fetch Articles that are exported. So kind of pretty self-explanatory, Fetch Article by ID gives in, says given an article ID returns an article object. Fetch Articles by Section returns a list of articles whose section attribute matches the argument. And then Fetch Articles returns a list of articles and we have an optional filters argument. So if no filters are provided, an array of all the articles is returned. If they are provided, we get an array of articles that meet the criteria that are returned. So as we're here, we're going to make use of the concept of fetch and async await. So to make API calls to outside resources within a React app, we'll have to make a fetch request. Fetch is inherently asynchronous and it returns a JavaScript promise. Promise objects must be resolved in order to get the data back using that then. We all, this is something we've done a couple of times and they have an example here. You know, if you have a function called get movies, you fetch to the movie API, returns a promise. Once the promise, promise is resolved, this dot then runs. And all this dot then promise does, in this case, it just returns the response and, and parses it from JSON. And then we have another one that just returns the JSON. So the problem with dot then is if we're not careful, we can end up in our own version of uh, JavaScript hell, like we did, like we showed with Ajax. So that's why we have something called async await as well. So this code here is kind of retooled using async await. So we use this keyword async before the function definition. And then we say let response equal await fetch. And then we say let data equal await response and then we return the data. So essentially what this does is it allows us to declare get movies as an asynchronous function. When that's called the await, it awaits the completion of the fetch request and saves the result to response. And then it goes to the next line. So this is the same thing as using a fetch and several dot thens. It just allows you to <coughs> uh, save you some time, uh, save you some lines, and you don't need to get stuck into dot then function, dot then function, dot then function. So there's a bunch of unit tests that we're going to have to pa pass <coughs> in order to get these things working. I'm going to create a new tab here. Get into new site three. And I forgot how to run tests. It's NPM, is it just NPM test? Okay, so we have some things here. I'm going to run only failed test this time. <coughs> All right, so we have some kind of read property map of undefined in appnav.test.js. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. Looking for the API ones. Are they not here? Hmm. All right, not sure why the API tests aren't showing up. So we can take a look at them at least. It says calls articles API dot fetch article by ID should return an API object. I know, maybe I have to go into the API folder. That doesn't sound right. <coughs> hmm. All right, I'm not going to worry too much about the test then in that case, because that just seems like a pain that I don't want to deal with just yet. So let's try doing this fetch article by ID using this async, uh, async option that they have here.
So I'm not, can we just do async here? Does that work or is that not allowed? <laughs> well, it's not causing any errors yet. So. Um, I think you need to put async after the equal sign because that's where the function actually is. Let's try that, like right here. Yep. yep. Yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's how you do it when it's a fat arrow function. All right, so now that we've declared that this is an asynchronous function, uh, we're, uh, so we have an article ID. We know that our API is localhost 3000. So we'd want to say, you know, let response equal fetch. And then where are we fetching to? Probably, yep. probably articles with an ID. Yep. So localhost 3001 slash API slash articles slash article ID. And we need to make sure we say this is a wait, like so. Forgot your double forward slash after Thank HTTP. You. All right, so we've fetched from there. And then, so that should give us a, job, a JSON response, right? So what's the next step? I had to turn into um, the, the dot JSON to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we could say, you know, let article equal await response dot JSON. That's how they do it here, after all. And then we just need to return the article. All right. So I'm still confused why this, why the tests aren't working. I would like to run the test because that's the easiest way to make sure that we know it's working. But we could do something, you know, in our app, in our app.js for some, if we want to just be, you know, get this working just a bit. <laughs> so I'm just going to do this for now, even though I have to import this first one and I. Because we have this export here. So what I did, import all from dot slash API slash articles api.js. No, that's not working. Oh, wait a second. I just thought of something. <laughs> uh, I think the API articles test is its own. Oh, it's a, uh, might be a jest file. So may need to run it differently. Man, now I'm like second guessing myself because I haven't done, run a test, a jest file in a while. So I'm going to try something real quick. So one second. Making sure I'm doing this correctly. So we want to run the tests. What do we run? NPM run test. Okay, now it's still doing the entire React app. All right. Oh, okay. We've got some API stuff. Okay, cool. There it is. App.test.js. Yeah, yeah. Where's the API stuff? Uh, you could do a, a regex uh, the same way instead of just doing the failed. Um, if you go down to the bottom of your options, you could filter by like the specific file name. Oh, or, uh... cool. Thank you. So that would be. So if you start typing API 
it'll pull okay. in as many ones now you pick and choose or you narrow it down. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I didn't even know about this. Did you just press the down arrow to select that? Yep. All right, it says just skipped all of them. Well, that's annoying. Let's try this again. So I just do API. Okay, here we go. That looks better. Okay. So test two failed, 10 skipped, one passed. I don't know why it's skipping tests or maybe that's just the other tests that we're not ignoring. Now we can look up here and we should see yep, articles API. Uh, fetch articles doesn't work because we haven't done it. Fetch articles by section doesn't work yet. But we did pass uh, fetch article by ID. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, cool. So now next we have to do fetch articles by section. And we already, it already kind of showed us how to filter by section, right? Well, it already showed us how to add a filter, which was up here. So we have our locos 3000 API articles. And then we say filter equals something. So we can do this pretty, it's almost the exact same, it's really honestly the same thing as this, just with a different API endpoint. Because we can do let response equal await fetch. And it's still gonna be HTTP slash slash localhost 3001 slash API slash articles. But instead of just going slash with that, we need to add some filters. I'm gonna add a question mark and then filter equals. Then we've got this JavaScript object here where colon. And in this case, we only need to worry about the section. So we section. And this is where we say, this is going to be our section. All right, I think that looks all right. And then we need to parse it from JSON. And then we just return the articles. That await is probably going to break because you don't have async. Oh, you're right. I don't. Thank you for pointing that out. Let's try it. So let's change that. Fetch articles by section equals async. Thank you. All right, so now we have two passing tests and one failed test. All right, any questions about what we've done so far? I know, uh, what did you have to do to get the test to run again? I kind of missed part of that. Uh, so when we're in this, after I did NPM run test, it's essentially set to reset automatically as soon as we change something. So if I just add a second line and save, it'll automatically start running the test suite again. OK. Any other questions? Okay, so last is fetch articles, which we see here is got some, its behavior is rather different. 
when we, because uh, it's if we, the filters are optional. So we either need to include the filters if they exist or don't include them if they don't. So we're going to need some conditional stuff here. So first I'm going to make sure this is asynchronous. So we could do something like if filters and then have an else here as well. And the else is pretty simple because we're just go, uh, fetching from locals 3001 slash API slash articles without any filters or any kind of need for uh, honestly anything else. So you could say let articles, or sorry, we could say let response equal await fetch HTTP colon slash slash locals 3000 and one slash API slash articles. And then return the articles. Um, <clears throat> if we move line 19 and 20 to the outside of the elf clause, oh, sorry, the else clauses, um, couldn't we just within the first if to a, a response and then basically move all that logic outside so that way you don't have to type it twice. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Let's try that out. So, but we need, in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have this option ready. So we're still going to do let response equal await and then fetch. And we'll get the, you know, the first part in. The question is, okay, now what do we do? You just wrapped your fetch inside of an await call, like a function call, instead of being. Oh, thank you. Oop. VS Code tries to help you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we'd have to do something like. Uh, question mark and mm -hmm. um, filter. And then we'd set up, you know, this part. And we'd still have to have our where. And then so now we thing is we don't know what type of filter it is. So let's see what actually, do we know what kind of arguments it's going to give? So the filters argument is optional. So let's take a look at our test suite and see what actually it's going to be passed in as an argument. OK, so their version doesn't give us an argument. So that's not very helpful. So we don't know what type of argument it's going to be giving us. Does it say here? Well, that's definitely a blind side in our testing in that case. So I'm going to make some assumptions about what it is, like what it's going to do, because based on the things they used here are filtered key and filtered value. So I'm just going to use that as, argu as argument names. And assuming it's going to follow that, so that format, but I could be wrong. <laughs> filtered key, filtered value. So it'd be Uh, is it possible that it would be filters.filter key or something? You are right. It absolutely would be.
All right, we still have a failed test. So let's take a look at what failed. Okay, just says call failed. Not very, not very useful in this case. So I'm noticing here that VS Code is being helpful again and says response is declared, but its value is never read. But we use it down here. So any quest, anyone have any idea of what's ha why we're getting this kind of uh, thing happening? You got to declare it before the if because it, VS Code doesn't understand the if since you got an else and response is assigned in both mm -hmm. of those. Yep. So I'm going to de declare a response to exist here. So response is defined and then filled later, filled in the if else's. And that allows us to pass our tests. So we were having a problem of scope where response was defined in this if and this else, and therefore wasn't actually available when it got outside of that conditional statement. All right, and according to this, we have passed all of our API tests. Any questions about uh, fetching from an API like this? What are you doing? Um, if the filters weren't passed in as, well, I don't see how they wouldn't be passed in as an object, uh, but I guess an alternative way to find out exactly what was passed in and if we didn't know if it was filter keyword or filter value, um, with a console log there on like, let's say line 15, would mm -hmm. uh, console log uh, for the filters actually kind of help display. Yep. That would allow, give us a better idea of what filters are being passed in. But yeah, and our test file doesn't actually uh, use filters, so we don't know how it's going to be. So that doesn't help us yet. But yeah, that would be a good way of checking to see, OK, how is our input actually formatted? Not sure what's happening here. I tried to get out of the test mode, and I had this error here happening. And it won't let me leave this. It's going to close this window and not worry about it. All right. So let's see here. It's 1031 right now. Let's take a break. Uh, let's come back at, let's take a 10 minute break, come back at 1041 and we will continue with news site three.